what could you do with a display, with any display? What can you show on any display? And so once you have an answer to that question, which is literally whatever you want, what if you could show that information dimensionally? You can take any information that already exists in 2D or any information that was natively in 3D and then display that back dimensionally in 3D for multiple people to experience it. There's a lot of usage of this in visualization. So whether that's architectural visualization in 3D art, if you wanna showcase something uh, that you've created yourself, experiential marketing to draw the eye of people, retail applications, if you wanna show a product that maybe you don't have in store, molecular visualization comes to mind, like molecules are so, so tiny. What does it look like when you can actually start to see proteins and all of these different like clusters of things within the space as they exist? And so these are some of the many, many uh, use cases. Myself as an artist, like for me, it was a no brainer to kind of start showcasing some of the stuff that I'm doing in 3D, in 3D. And so it becomes this kind of like little diorama or this little world that you can um, display in the way that it was created. Today, we have a wild episode. We're joined by Arturo, the community manager at Looking Glass. He's not just an expert, he's a visionary in the realm of holographic displays. So buckle up and get ready to have your minds blown as we dive deep into this amazing technology by the company Looking Glass. What is a hologram to you? So what is a hologram? Uh, holograms are the future that we were promised. That's the way I like to think about it. And in the case of Looking Glass specifically, which is where I work now as the community manager, holograms are the uh, light field uh, in this case. And so a light field is in short, a distribution of points uh, within, you can think of it kind of as a point cloud, uh, but instead of actual points in space, it's where light uh, needs to be directed to. And so in the case of a looking glass display, like the one that you all have back there and the one that I have here, uh, what we're seeing is like a very intelligent and mathy way of distributing and uh, displaying <laughs> light. And so you can see that as I move this device here, we can see so the crazy. different angles um, that we would be uh, experiencing if we were kind of standing in the space. And uh, as you know, uh, from having one yourself, or if you happen to see one in person, if you're watching or listening to this, uh, then you'll know that if you stand in you know, a different angle while you're staring at a different uh, at a looking glass display, you'll be seeing what you would see in that angle if that were actually in that box or in that display, uh, which is, is really a wild thing. And that's why I say it's the future that we were promised. Like. We live in a three like D world, right? Yeah, and so yeah. Why are, you know, why not see stuff in three D as well? It's just mind blowing. Yeah, I would also say for anyone who's listening who uh, who maybe doesn't have the visual up with them right now, um, I, the best way I would describe a looking glass display is uh, as someone who's who's a you know a gamer from time to time. Um, I think back to the Nintendo three DS and thinking like how cool is it that we have a 3d display and like it was cool but it it definitely like kind of it didn't really kind of suck right <laughs> yeah kind of suck. Um, but like when i first saw a looking glass display you know it it has elements of that to it but it, really that doesn't even encapsulate it because it is so much more than that it is it, the viewing angle is not nearly as locked um it's also just like a very nice looking display i don't know exactly um how resolution might translate to a holographic display versus a, a typical you know flat panel display but it looks crisp it looks clean the color Super reproduction crisp. is amazing and it's one of those things where like you see you see a display and you cannot help but sort of all you want to do is interact with it you want to look at it from different angles you want to you want to move your head around you want to kind of look up and down it is it is a really excellent um, uh, piece of technology that I think people have maybe gotten glimpses of or uh, have an idea of what it might be, but I think it is something that you really do need to see for yourself. Oh, man. Yeah, it's it's like almost... I hate that when we talk about it, anybody that sees it, they're seeing it through a 2D display. So you like don't get the actual 3D just oomph, you know? I mean, it, it's just crazy, especially, you know, I know on the ones we've got there was like a few um ones already preloaded a few displays like there's one with a bumblebee on it and it it just it looks real like it looks like a, a huge like six inch bumblebee that you can just grab and no matter where you turn it just it looks 3d it, I, it is just mind-blowing I, I still don't comprehend it um it's crazy technology. So, so on on sort of talking on that, Arturo, just about this product range that 
Looking Glass has. So um, what is the product range and what are the applications beyond just obviously as as artists and sort of tech nerds, Mikey and I, when we first had ours, we're just like, it's so fun to play with. It's fun. <laughs> you know, as 3D artists, we're primed to say, like, let's take the stuff that we've already made in 3D and load it on. And just, you know, for us, like the the novelty of that is enough. But what are the applications of the Looking Glass product line? And maybe what are some of the coolest ways you've seen these devices being used? I get this question quite a bit. And so the answer that I've been working on uh, kind of comes down to the short version is what could you do with a display, with any display? What can you show on any display? And so once you have an answer to that question, which is literally whatever you want, uh, the answer for the Looking Glass displays is what, what if you could show that information dimensionally? And so that's a difference, I think, that I've worked out. The big, like, switcher, the big clincher is, like, you can take any information that already exists in 2D or any information that was natively in 3D and then display that back dimensionally in 3D for multiple people to experience it. And so uh, to answer the second half of that question, what are some of the applications that I've seen or that I find really interesting for this? Um, there's a lot of usage of this in visualization. So whether that's architectural visualization, obviously, as we talked about, and we're all, well, the three of us and some of us watching are familiar with uh, in 3D art, if you want to showcase something uh, that you've created yourself, experiential marketing to draw the eye of people, uh, retail applications, if you want to show a product that maybe you don't have in store or you want to show it in a way that just wouldn't be able to to uh be done in the in the physical world mm -hmm. um as well as um like uh, yeah i mentioned visualization uh, molecular visualization comes to mind uh, a lot of the the programs that are uh, being used for all these kind of research and discovery and research and development labs uh, are flat screens and and because uh, as you might imagine like molecules are so so tiny um and, and kind of hard to get a read on when they're all laid out in a 2D image. What, uh, the, what does it look like when you can actually start to see proteins and all of these different like clusters of things within the space as they exist in the body or whatever uh, kind of item you're, you're studying? And so these are some of the many, many uh, use cases that I've seen and some of the ones that I find really interesting. Myself as an artist, like for me, it was a no-brainer to... Um, to kind of start showcasing some of the stuff that I'm doing in 3D, in 3D. I'm the only one that gets to experience what that looks like as I'm building stuff out in Blender, which is my tool of choice, or uh, in Unreal. Um, I'm the one that knows what that scene looks like, and I would have to share the scene with you or with somebody else or render out a video if I wanted them to get an idea of like all this stuff I put so much hard work into. And so like in this um, example that I have here of a hologram that I made, this is uh, mostly different kit bash assets that I was working with. Mm. And there's a bunch of different little like trash cans on the left and stuff and, and just some details. That kind of reveal that... themselves as you, exactly. as you rotate the display. So in, in your exactly. first fixed field of view, you're not, even ca you're not even really experiencing the entirety of that scene. Exactly. And wow. so it becomes this kind of like little diorama or this little world that you can um, display in the way that it was created. And that kind of also brings me to a little bit just about Looking Glass beyond just the hardware itself, right? So there are some software applications and, and I guess you could call it maybe social applications as well that you've sort of built on top of this technology. Um, and one of them that comes to mind is blocks, right? And so I think it's so interesting that you've, you've led by saying, um, imagine what you can uh, see on a, a typical display. Now imagine if you can incorporate depth into that. And obviously as 3D artists or 2D artists or you know motion designers, animators, you understand that there are, you know, you you have an understanding of what's left on the cutting room floor, you know, what's left in the scene that other people don't see. And the reason that we have to make those decisions is because our audience typically, you know, if you're a VR artist, not every person knows or owns or wants to use a VR headset. Not every person um, has maybe specific apps on their phone that allows them to interact with AR or, you know, specific technologies like that. So it seems to me like the looking glass has not only like made it a priority to create a uh, display that removes the need for sort of third party tools. But there's also this, you know, the way that blocks is pitched is like say goodbye to gifts and say hello to holograms. And it's an interesting way to experience 
these looking, you know, what we're describing as a, a, the looking glass display. It's a way to experience kind of interactively, even just on a 2D screen, what that parallax and what that depth might look like. So I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit more about sort of the methodology about some of the other apps that you're building on top of the looking glass ecosystem to complement the hardware that's already so amazing. A hundred percent. That's a, uh, that's a perfect tee up for blocks. It's the way that you can create, share, and display. So a lot of the content that was being created for the Looking Glass, at least in its nascency, um, and the company is uh, somewhere around like 14 years old now at the time of like recording this video, but the, the portrait uh, was launched out of Kickstarter, I believe in 2018. That's how I got a hold of mine uh, mm. well before joining the company. And I just wouldn't shut up about it. So they reached out to me <laughs> and <laughs> were like, hey, we like the stuff that you're doing. And you, you know, you really, it seems like you really like it too. And it was just a natural fit. A lot of the stuff that I was making for the Looking Glass kind of stayed at the Looking Glass. And then it becomes a little bit, at least at the time, it becomes a little bit tricky to show people uh, like it translates really well on video for something that's so kind of magical in person. Uh, but again, some of that content was getting stuck there. And so blocks was kind of a response to that, which was what if the content that you're making for the looking glass could be shared with other people in a really e simple package could be something that you can embed on a website and on your portfolio, but then also be viewable in augmented reality uh, headsets and virtual reality headsets in WebXR via uh, these embeds and, and websites and obviously on looking glass displays. And so then it becomes, you can kind of create something uh, out of something new or something that you've already had. You can share it with anybody and host it on, on your own. And then you can display it pretty much anywhere, um, which I think just kind of enables uh, anybody who is not actively or currently a looking glass creator to be a looking glass creator, but then also to be able to share in, uh, the uh, renders of the stuff that they're working on in all these kind of cross-dimensional and cross-platform uh, ways. Mm. Which is, it's, it's, that's kind of a bold move to, move to take as a, a company producing hardware to make an application that is device agnostic and allows people who maybe don't own the, the hardware. So do you think that, that, I mean, as someone who owns the display, I can tell you I've looked at blocks and they are amazing representations, you know, of the display that I have in person, um, you know, online or on my phone, but you know, do you do you think that that move is because the technology that you've built in the the physical displays themselves, you know, is so magical that it's like even if you have that experience online or have that experience in another device, that you're going to ultimately want to see it on the Looking Glass display itself. Absolutely, and I think it's a way to to democratize and make it more accessible to create for us. Uh, unfortunately, just by the way that the world works, there are some con uh, some countries that we can't ship Looking Glasses to. And so what does it mean for, but, you know, the internet for the most part of some parts of the world is something that's accessible. And so then we're kind of allowing these uh, creatives to also take part in this ecosystem. Uh, and n again, beyond our own ecosystem and our own community to be able to showcase the stuff that they're working on uh, in a way that others can experience dimensionally. And I think that's a, one of the big driving forces of blocks is you don't need to have a looking glass display in order to use it. Uh, to use blocks, you don't even need to be making 3D content because you can just upload a 2D image now and we'll generate a depth map for you on the fly and be and show you that um, in a way as though you were looking at a looking glass that's embedded on your uh, computer or on your display. Um, but you can do that, you know, without needing one. And as you mentioned, or, or like as I, I like to allude to, but you'll want to see it in one and and you're only one link away from sending it to somebody on our discord and having them record what it actually looks like on a display if they do have one and so it's, it's this beautiful uh, union between uh like creativity somewhat of this like open source uh spirit even though blocks is not an open source tool and accessibility i yeah th that is too crazy it is funny because um yeah just using it the looking glass, I feel like as I've had some people come over and they were like, Oh, you know, like if I got one, how is it hard to use? Like, could I instantly just be uploading photos and um, just get off? Or do I have to be like a 3d modeler or animator to use it? And yeah, I mean, just using the website that you guys had naturally, the, the depth map and how good the photos come out just right off the bat is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I also, I just want to rewind a little bit because I, I do want to say it is funny how many people have come to my house and I've shown this and they just lose their shit. Like, like it's crazy. It's the crazy. craziest, funniest uh, 
cool thing. And um, yeah, and and it's cool too, like how just easy it is to use and how much you can just like pull up a family photos and, you know, just use that for pretty much anything you want to upload. Um, with the depth map, is there any difference? Like how, how much would you say there is either a quality gain or loss between using just a photo versus rendering it out in like Cinema 4D or Unreal Engine? There, there is a noticeable difference if you're in the space or in the world because you're not getting information from all the angles if you're mm. uploading an image. So if I'm uploading an image, uh, there's and there's a little bit of an asterisk there. If I'm uploading a, a 2D image that was natively in, in 2D, uh, then the the service and the tools that we're using uh, create a an approximation of what the other sides that the the like computer's eye is not seeing. And so by proxy, you kind of get this degradation of the image, which we allow you to tweak after the fact. So you can upload the image and then fix how depthy it is and where the focus focal point is. Uh, and so you can kind of get around that and mitigate it. Um, and honestly, it doesn't look all that uh, broken up. I can actually show you a quick demo of that uh, yeah. in a second. But if you're using, if you're rendering out of something like Cinema 4D, Blender, Unreal Engine, Unity, WebXR, and all these other different um, uh, creation suites that we have tools and plugins for, then you're actually getting the holistic picture because you have the information, as I uh, mentioned earlier, from all these different camera angles that exist within uh, those software plugins. And so, when you're standing in the far right, you're seeing what was actually there in the 3D scene, as opposed to an approximation of what the artificial intelligence that's creating the depth map uh, mm. is generating to make it kind of seem like it's filling in the space. All that said, in painting tools and, and these AI tools, as we know, are just getting stronger and stronger and better and better. And so it it's it, I, I don't anticipate it being too long from now uh, where we'll actually get like something that's like really close to approximating what it actually uh, looks like. And so this yeah, is it, a, uh, a, uh, wow. Uh, stable diffusion <laughs> render uh, that I made of the Ninja Turtles hanging out at the subway station. And it's not, you know, this was a 2d image, um, but with blocks, we're creating a depth map for it. And whoa, it looks like I'm going to drop this. There we go. We're creating a depth map for it and then showing you uh, what the different angles would have looked like. Uh, and you that can, you can hardly tell, only if you're really, really close, uh, can you tell that I was going to say, there. yeah, it seems like, I, like, it's just so good. Like, I feel like, the, you know, from my experience, I haven't gotten around to playing with it too much and I'm just excited to keep playing with it. But I, I've just been blown away by how good the pictures look on the display and like how good the depth map is and how you know i haven't noticed too many um like things that made me say oh that was clearly a photo versus a 3d render you know it, the depth map is just excellent but i will say i've noticed that even some 3d models that i've tried like 3d to 3d some of them look better and some of them look like great and some of them look good um is there any, just because I know you've messed around with it a lot more than me, is there any tips that you have for making like, oh, just a really rocking uh, 3D render or hologram display? Uh, there are many and you can find them on our docs page, uh, which is at look.glass forward slash docs. We have a whole um, sort of creative getting started uh, and like tips from the community as well as a team. But the one that I would say that comes immediately to mind is to make use of the display's focal plane. So there's a actual like physical point in the display in which things are sharpest. And we try to approximate this in the software uh, tooling and Blender, Unity, and all those tools that we mentioned earlier to make it uh, simpler for folks to take an object in that 3D scene and put it on the focal plane of the different cameras. And then when you render out, anything that's on that focal plane will be in complete sharp focus and anything further back uh, will kind of fall off in a way. I have an, uh, maybe this example won't work here, but if I pull up uh, this Halloween creepy scene that I made, um, I can illustrate that using Looking Glass Studio, <laughs> which is uh, the tool that we use for um, for loading up holograms onto the display. So what I'm doing here is changing the depthiness, and we'll see what we can see is that the background is oh, kind wow. of falling further away. Um, and if I were to turn the display now, 
then you see that, oh, I've just disconnected it. But when it wasn't disconnected, uh, let me move the camera instead. Uh, oh, look at that. They're kind of elongated. And so now I'm going to pull the depth back. Has like a ghost trail to yeah. it. Right. And, so and now... I like it because it's fitting because they kind of look ghostly. Oh, they're very ghost-like. <laughs> and now I'll change the focus and you can see that they kind of come forward on the display, but they're out oh, of focus. Oh, wild. And now yeah. they're back in the focal plane. And so playing around with these tools, which uh, the majority of them allow you to actually in real time uh, see the... Uh, the work that you're doing on the display um, to maximize the sharpness of the hologram that will yield the best result. Mm. Uh, wow. And just as a little tidbit, I'll just play this like really creepy uh, stable diffusion transformation. Amazing. Here. That is so good. Um, it's wild. It is wild. And as someone who is, <clears throat> as someone who's used the Blender plugin, um, it's so, so solid. And uh, every all of these terms um, that Arturo is mentioning, they, they there are physical uh, UI displays that make it sort of easier, I think, to understand how these I you know how these concepts work. So you have you know your focal plane, but then you also have you know essentially what is clip start and and clip end. You know what how close to the camera are objects in your 3D scene impacting the render, how far away. And as you sort of, uh, and again, because it's all real time, I mean, that's the beauty of it is you can very quickly make adjustments on the fly before you even begin the rendering process um, and, and kind of see that in real time. Um, I'm also curious too, uh, as someone who's used the Blender plugin and has made a few of my sort of 3D scenes, translated them to the looking glass display, this concept of, of quilting um, and sort of like the maybe a, a little bit more of a technical conversation around some of the technology that you're using in render time to, uh, to create from a 3D content app as opposed to a photo, um, you know, I think there's uh, the the default on the Blender plugin is to to render 48 is it 48 views per frame, um, and put that into a, a quilt, which then is loaded is up. So, so wild. But so is there a you know are there points of diminishing returns based on the size of the display versus the number of views you're rendering for each frame? Um, you know if you could just talk a little bit more about that and sort of what uh, the team at Looking Glass feels uh, in terms of giving options to artists and and what works best. Mm -hmm. Well, just as you mentioned, there are so quilts for those that uh, don't know, you can also find more information about this on our docs page, uh, which I mentioned, I'm sure will be somewhere here, but quilts are effectively the um, kind of de facto render format for looking glass, uh, which can be either a JPEG or PNG or a video file. Uh, and the way that they look, uh, we'll throw something up here on, on screen, but the way that they look is essentially like a sprite sheet. And so what you're looking at is actually uh, the 48 different views, as Andrew mentioned, of the different camera um, of the different camera angles that are being captured in that scene, uh, and so each one um, is actually a smaller resolution than as if than if you were to render out that one singular image. So in order to comprise a quilt of 48 different camera angles that are all kind of in this linear. Um, array of cameras, we actually shrink the resolution a little bit, but when we're displaying it back on the looking glass display, um, the perceptual resolution is somewhere between like 1080 and like 2K. Um, and so that's all kind of fine and dandy technical jargon, but the the kind of secret sauce or the, the trick uh, or one of the ones that I think is really interesting is that as you have more views to the scene, the background will actually be sharper. But the resolution, just by way of that math that I was mentioning, where each individual view is actually smaller resolution than the whole, that make up this entire uh, quilt, um, the resolution of the actual output hologram will be lower because each individual camera angle that's then getting reconstructed into this light field uh, is just like slightly lower resolution than it would be if you had fewer views. And so a short version to think about this is that if you want the background to be crisp or you don't want there to be too much uh, kind of stuttering or juddering in the background of your scene, then you would render out, um, if you don't want there to be too much stuttering, then you would render out more views, which means that the output of the hologram will be slightly degraded in terms of quality. Um, and if you want to have a really sharp hologram, then you would render uh, at a higher resolution per view, but a um, 
a lower, lower number, number of views. And so all of this, again, is in the in our docs page. But there is this kind of like sweet spot, depending on what, what you're trying to do, um, that you can toy around with. And again, you don't need to have a looking glass to play with this. You can start doing that on blocks like immediately as you're watching this or listening um, and, and trying to figure that out. But it, it's honestly one of those things of uh, like in creation and one of those uh, challenges to wrap your head around that I really enjoy uh, when it comes to like 3D creation, just creation and expression in general. Yeah, mm. I, I'm I'm just baffled. Honestly, I think one of the favorite things that I've seen on the looking glass display was the bar of chocolate. I still can't get over it. I mean, A, just visually stunning the way that the light glistened the off the 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 metal it just sold the depth so much like as you're turning your head you're just seeing the light glisten I, I was just shocked by that and then also i was shocked by how much it made me want to have a chocolate bar i was like <laughs> i was like this looks like it was like i think even in willy wonk and the chocolate factory didn't they have in the old version like mm -hmm. a 3d chocolate bar i can't even remember but I, it was just so good. I feel like one thing I could definitely see these displays being used for is like either drinks or food. Like if you went to a bar, I would I already, if you could just like swipe through the drink menu and you just saw like little cocktails going by in a 3D display. Woo! I mean, my God, I, there's no better way to sell a cocktail than just seeing True. like an ice cold beverage right in front of you in 3D. I mean, yeah. my God. My God. And not only that, not only that, but um, you know, it's funny actually. I've uh, we with the three of us, we've all had this conversation um, in person a little bit. But so I've I've worked with brands that you know one of the big things that I'll end up doing for them is hey, we have a we have a trade show booth at this big trade show, right? And so mm. there's a million. If anyone's been to like an NAB NYC or uh you know just just pick whatever whatever uh trade show that you might have been to because usually they all kind of follow the same format you're talking about like hundreds of vendors in a, in a massive space that all have a sizable amount of, of room to work with but basically the the first thing they have to do is figure out what what are we going to do to make our booth you know set apart from from everybody else's mm -hmm. just literally i mean it's it's not anything more complicated than sort of like shelf appeal um and, you know, I've worked with clients that have said, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this, like, we're going to have a bunch of uh, 2D displays, not not even 3D displays, we're going to get a bunch of 2D displays, we're going to link them together, we're going to play videos on it, we're going to have some like, not even interactive, but just, we're going to make use of an array of screens, right? Um, or, you know, and ultimately, the conversation becomes, well, uh, hey, Andrew, you're here doing something for us for 3D product visualization, or, mm. you know, whatever it might be, do you know of anything that we could, you know, use and interact with. And for the longest time, the answer was like, look, I mean, yes, you could probably find some VR artists and like rent some headsets or get an app company to develop some sort of app that, you know, people could scan a QR code and suddenly they could interact with your products on their phones or whatever. Um, you know, but all of that's like pretty heavy lift. Now, now that I have a looking glass display and, you know, especially thinking like, of the uh, capabilities of something like Unreal, which is a real-time render engine, and like being able to potentially work with this stuff in real time on a looking glass display, you know what kind of opportunities that opens up in terms of interactivity. If I were at a trade show and I walked by a booth that ha that was making use of something like a looking glass display, you're immediately going to want to go over and interact with that. Absolutely. And I think that's true of you know, Mikey. You were saying everyone that's come to your house, I. I live, you know, my wife is, is, uh, she's certainly creative, but she does not, she doesn't work in 3d. She's not an animator. You know, she's the, the, a lot of what I nerd out on. She's like, you can talk about it, but I'm not going to understand any of it. This is the first time where it's like, you put a display in, so, in front of someone and they're like, you have no choice, but to be like, I have to look around this I can interact <laughs> with it. And so all it's a showstopper. Like, a yes. And all of that is a very, it's know? a very long, long winded way of getting to this question that I have, which is sort of like. Obviously, the artistic side is very exciting, but um, how is Looking Glass sort of shaping the future of retail and advertising? Mm -hmm. um, and what are some successful use cases you might have seen um, leveraging the, the Looking Glass display maybe in some of these formats? Just as, as you mentioned, in the, the trade show space, it's really popular. And it's something that as a community manager, I have the, the privilege of interacting with the artists in our community 
creative agencies and like enterprise partners who have ideas um, like typically it's either they are being pitched or pitching or want to pitch um, and are trying to think outside of the box. And uh, as you alluded to, which is something I've experienced too, it's a, it's a neck breaker. If you're walking past one and you see it and it catches your, you catch it in your vision, you're going to want to go, if you haven't seen it before, you'll definitely go, what the hell is that? And then mm. walk over. Uh, when we were when we demoed blocks for the first time in public and announced it at AWE last year, um, it was just wild. I feel like we were you know the the kind of bells of the ball. Even though we were demoing uh, blocks in the headset and the capability that you could have this in the headset, it was the sort of thing where if you were walking past, you kind of wanted to go, oh, what was that? And you can stand as far away as you wanted to and just kind of geek out a little bit about what was going on and obviously if you're coming up close or you have some questions and stuff you could see it but one of the things that i noticed which is no shame or, or shade to uh headsets at all because i think there's like a time and a place for them but nobody wanted to put on the headset because what the, the question that came up the most was are you going to show me the same thing that's on here yes well why would i want to put it on you know why would i want to put on this headset that a <laughs> hundred or so other people may have put on and so it kind of becomes this thing where you can, if you're at a trade show, as you mentioned, or somewhere where you're showing something off, you can get people in and out as quickly as possible or hold their attention for as long as you like. Um, and one of the other ways that we uh, are kind of, I really say comfortably, like innovating in the space is through the use of artificial intelligence. And in this case, Lightforms, which is our application uh, for holographic avatars powered by ChatGPT. But the idea can be the same with any wow. sort of like LLM or any lar large language model uh, that's conversational or trained to be conversational. And that's what would it be like if you could have an avatar that you communicate with who has all this knowledge that exist on the internet or also custom knowledge. Jesus. And so uh, a lot of our partners and friends and, and uh, something that we've deployed several times uh, since the inception of uh, Lightforms earlier this year is these kind of uh, bespoke uh, characters that will show up at a uh, Greenpoint Film Festival. For example, we had, uh, which was here locally uh, in New York, we had a whale that was very knowledgeable in not just uh, flipping boats over and also like the ocean life of being a Zephyr uh, whale from South Africa, but also um, uh, was very knowledgeable about the show times and the directors and the kind of like premises of the movies that were showing at the Greenpoint Film Festival. So people that were walking by and caught the, you know, they're like, whoa, is that a whale in a display that is like 3D? So that's a showstopper right there. And then you can walk up to it and you're, you know, you overhear somebody asking, hey, at what time is this movie playing and where? And then the whale like will answer with its own personality. And so these kind of deployments wow. of the light forms is, I think, one of the ways that um, we're kind of uh, expanding and branching out into into different spaces that normally wouldn't uh have a sort of conceptual way to bring in something like this uh, were it not for like a creative director or somebody who's like pitching them on these ideas. Um, I'm sure you can't, I'm sure if you could answer this, you, you know, or if there is an answer to this, I'm sure you probably can't, but I do have to ask, I mean, having just seen this, uh, this, this new release from uh, chat GPT being able to sort of uh, train your own uh, GPTs where I don't know exactly what the terminology they're using uh, custom GPTs, whatever. Where effectively you as a, if, I, if you have a chat, chat GPT plus account, you can upload what they call knowledge, right? Like a PDF or a word doc. Um, and then suddenly now you have a custom trained model. So you could feed it everything about, you know, uh, for, to your point about Greenpoint Film Festival, here are the showtimes, here are the directors, here are director's bios. Um, was building life forms in anticipation of something like that where, you, you know, did you just was was looking glass able to see the writing on the wall and see like okay we have this amazing technology in llms and ai that gives you sort of a broad knowledge but think about what it would look like if you were to hyper tailor that to a brand or an event or a trade show booth for example 
Yeah, this is some this uh, Lightform specifically is a project that Looking Glass has been working on for several years prior to the craze of AI in the last like two years. Uh, so back when IBM Watson was the big thing, the the big kid on the block, uh, there were there are like remnants online that you can find of of kind of. Uh, that teed up what Lightforms ended up being, uh, but thanks to ChatGPT and the accessibility of, of like the tools that OpenAI is, uh, has been making, uh, earlier this year we had this breakthrough moment where it just become became a lot simpler via APIs, via uh, Unity to combine all of this stuff that's um, available to us and then make something like uh, Lightforms out of it. And to the point of the, like the custom uh, GPTs and the custom knowledge, like. This, it's not surprising to anyone on the team. I think I can say that uh, with comfort, but I'll definitely speak for myself. It was not surprising to see that uh, custom GPT uh, came out later now because this is something that people were doing kind of from the early days of playgrounds on OpenAI was how do I uh, package all of this kind of personality and spunk into this assistant and then share that with somebody else. So it was only a matter of time before they came along and kind of made it official. And I think that will only make the sort of stuff that we're doing a little bit stronger because now it's not this kind of hackish way of giving, taking what is the base model of uh, chat GPT and having and, and completions and like making that um, have this life. But now you can actually imbue it with life directly from the beginning as though it were something as it is something now that uh, they're placing a lot of heavy focus on. Right. And as some, you know, as someone who's worked with uh, creative directors or heads of marketing, like the ability to, you know, talk about like brand equity or, uh, you know, just making sure that your brand is represented in a good way. You know, uh, chat GPT six months ago might not have been the best option because obviously yeah. as we've, you know, conversations go around uh, hallucinations or it's, it's just too broad, but to be able to fine tune that specifically to a goal or a task or a personality suddenly becomes, it, it becomes a much easier conversation about, is this something that you'd want to be using? Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, we've seen a lot in the sort of engagements that we've had, some of them that I can speak to and some that I can't uh, yet. But uh, if you look online, you can find them. Uh, the um, That is very much a concern. And so it became this uh, interesting challenge for the team uh, working on Lightforms to figure out how can we uh, take ChatGPT and effectively uh, use it, but also erase it. Like we don't want to hear as an AI language model, I can't answer that question because that kind of breaks the magic. And that's what the mm. company and what this, the hardware and the software that we're putting together is all about is that magical moment. And so how can you have, how can you create a character uh, with text and with this kind of body, this hologram existence uh, that will curtail uh, kind of questions that it doesn't want to answer or that it doesn't have the answer to in a way that is tactful, effective, doesn't break the magic, uh, and keeps the the brand or the uh, moment, like in the case of Greenpoint Film Festival, uh, moving. Right? We don't want to. We don't want to kind of break that wall of as an AI language model. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And um, yeah, there's. I think this like beauty to to that fine tuning uh, that has been. I think instrumental in, in actually feeling like if you've spoken to these characters, which you all have, uh, and if if anyone's interested, look dot glass forward slash light forms it'll be somewhere around where you find this video but it's l-i-t-e-f-o-r-m-s um you can speak to them yourself and uh interact with them so you can tell uncle rabbit who's kind of the the main driving uh light form have a carrot and then a carrot will drop down and he'll chew on it spoiler uh and then there's all these other little tidbits that you can hide because as as you all know for from being in the 3d space and maybe if you're listening or watching too um, you know, it's a Unity application. So anything you can do in Unity, you can now do in this uh, in this tool. And so what does that look like if I am a big name brand, insert here, and I want to trigger an action with a specific keyword that will show up in this holographic display and have this character kind of show you, hey, um, what does this shoe look like in this color? And then boom, it's there mm. uh, because now we have all these generative tools. It just kind of opens up a whole new world yeah. of interactivity. Got to get one for the Wendy's Twitter account. <laughs> oh, oh my God, that would be wild. <laughs> but honestly, though, the funny thing is, is maybe not Wendy's Twitter account, but I mean, the amount of fun you can have interacting with a brand is kind of mind blowing. I mean, the fact that people will spend billions of dollars just to have 
a 15 to 30 second ad spot on TV. And here we are. I mean, for me, when we were interacting with the like forms, it's like you want to spend 30 minutes interacting with these things. You know, how cool is that? And if you were able to do that with like a company or a brand or a mascot, I mean, that is just that's so cool. And it's so fun because also I think we all have questions about certain things and to be able to ask it directly and and get these fun responses back versus having like a Google search or reading the about me on their website. You know, it, it's just it's kind of a game changer. So cool. So cool. There's um the one example that I always go to and kind of came to first the first time I saw Uncle Rabbit come to life, which is what if you could learn about physics from Einstein and you can it, you have this little Einstein character and we take all wow. the writing and all the information of it, it could be Einstein or anybody else right who's uh, has a lot of information out there uh, right. open to the world to use and take that information and view it into this character and then have them explain it back to you at whatever level of complexity you would like um, there's all this kind of talk around especially with chat GPT and obviously deep fakes and all these AI tools of like the discomfort of bringing back the dead or bringing back or, or like oh, creating wow. somebody that isn't Shh. there. And with different in different cultures, see that differently. Uh, for some people, they still communicate with their elders, even though they're no longer here or somebody that may have just passed away. And it's this kind of like sure. filling moment. And it's beautiful here in the Western world. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, but all in all, I think for me as a learner, I think it would just be so engaging to be able to like ask one of these great thinkers, uh, even though it's, you know, it could be like a Pixar S character or some fo fo photo real character, ask all these kind of questions and then know that in the background, there's this body of knowledge that is to some degree tuned to not give me false information, but I'm now like sitting in a classroom with this Einstein and like learning about mm. physics and yeah. seeing all these interactive, like, you know, what is this? I think we'll get to the point where we could be like, so could you draw this equation out and like try to explain it to me graphically and leverage the power of these tools to, to make that happen? That's the future I'm excited about. Yeah. Wow. It's, oh. it's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mikey. Oh, well, I was almost thinking like, how crazy cool is it? This is like a mixture between like Cortana and mm. her. Like I'm almost mm -hmm. imagining mixed with your Google home, like how cool it would be to have your own avatar, either that you created or something of that nature downloaded. And it has kind of a personality tweaked however you wanted, even to reflect your own. And that it could, you could say like download physics today. I have a bunch of physics questions and it could be like tweak its own model. And then it's like, you could almost develop like a personality with it and you can talk to it. That is just so cool. I, I mean, it's so cool. And I'm even thinking too, sorry, there was so much there to unpack. Like, but I, I so curious on the educational aspect for even kids, like talk about a rabbit, like being able to learn its ABCs, like how much more fun that would be with like a hologram versus that's interactive versus a TV. That's just kind of yelling at you, mm. you know, that's just, Oh man, so much there. Well, it's it's sort of like it's it's interesting because as you talk through this, it's the conversation for me at least goes to this idea of taking ownership back of you know in in the post internet world where everything is type into a box, get results, filter the results, to, you know, take what works for you, uh, further refine your search. It's arduous. It's it can be very tiresome, especially if you have if there's specificity. I think uh, Arturo, you mentioned this idea of uh, explaining things at different layers of complexity. You know, like sometimes I need yeah. the I need the I know nothing about it version, and then there are other dumber. times. Yeah, there are other dumber. <laughs> other times, dumb. like, I I have a foundational knowledge, and I'm trying to build on that. Right. It's very hard to there, you know, the levers that you can push and pull with traditional like web search or uh, knowledge hunting on the internet. The, there, there are some for sure, but like they are not nearly as robust as what you can see accomplished with, you know, to your point, like training uh, an AI on a specific set of data. It, it, you know, imagine it's like if you use any complex program, just think about taking the release notes and the manual from that program, giving it to a GPT, and then saying, hey, 
rather than having to look up in the table of contents, this one section that I'm looking for, you can just type in your question. You know, it's, it, it gives you sort of this like ownership back of it saves you time. It makes it more direct. You know, you feel like you suddenly are actively involved in the process that you're not sort of just like this passive consumer of, of knowledge. And I think it's so interesting because it's like, again, we're talking about looking glass displays, uh, you know, this idea of like a holographic display, but it seems to me that looking glasses really position themselves as this pivot point between all of these moving technologies and, and seemingly very, very strong at bringing them together into a sort of ecosystem that works and builds off of, you know, off of these seemingly disparate pieces of technology. It's been, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been there since April of last year and it's, you know, I, uh, before still am today, but before, uh, joining looking glass, I have my YouTube channel. Um, and there I kind of take all of this information that I'm learning, uh, whether it's about how to use tools like blender or unreal or polycam and, um, was just kind of sharing this with the world. Like my background uh, prior to Looking Glass, I worked at CS50 at Harvard, uh, which is the world's largest computer science class and kind of kicked off the massive open online courseware um, oh, wow. movement. And I actually took that class when I was living in Miami, Florida. I'm originally from Venezuela, but my, my family moved to Miami uh, in 2002, kind of fleeing the situation there. And um, uh, so I, you know, I grew up in Miami. I went to community college and I kind of wanted out you know, so I'm like, I have to learn something that I can do from anywhere. Uh, I can have a laptop now. And so I started taking this class online to learn how to code. And it's a class that's taught out of Harvard University. It's been taught there for 20 plus years. Uh, but the professor decided, hey, I'm going to make this open source. I'm going to film my lectures like they're Netflix movies and uh, just teach the world how to code. And so I took it in Miami. Very long story short, got to meet the team. Uh, was extended an offer to work with the team, worked there for around five to six years, uh, developing the lectures uh, as a photographer. Yeah, as a photographer and cinematographer and helping uh, ed like educate and build this course that I took myself, which has millions of active students online, 800 at Harvard and 400 or so at Yale uh, concurrently. And it's actually running now at the moment. It's free, completely free. You don't have to pay anything and it'll teach you so much. But it came from this drive of like, I want to know how the stuff like this phone in my pocket and my computer work at a really deep level. Um, and I think like with the stuff that we're doing um, with like AI, we're, we kind of have to, we're at this point where like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all these things are kind of, you should know that already, right? Like people that are coming up now kind of are diving into this AI space. But what I wanted to get to with that whole like background was um, I got to a point where I wanted to augment the stuff that I was doing with photography and film with 3D. And um, I was trying to do it with After Effects, but that laptop that I mentioned just could not handle After Effects. And for some reason I had been putting off learning Blender, uh, but I decided, you know what? It's going to be easier for me to figure out how to use this free and open source tool than for me to dive into After Effects right now with this computer because I'm literally pulling my hair out. And I'm so glad that I did uh, because I, I got to not just learn how to make stuff in 3D, but then take it out of that 3D world to like a Snapchat filter or a hologram. And so the reason why I'm giving all this backstory is because I think the stuff that we're doing at Looking Glass is this beautiful mixture of all of these different like nodes and pods of my life, but also of the world that are so like embedded in and awake and like prescient into the stuff where we're going now, where like the, one of the latest releases that we'd done for uh, light forms that we were talking about earlier was custom characters. So you can't upload your own custom uh, like 3D model yet. Uh, this is something that's being worked on and doesn't have like a, a like finish date at the moment because we're working on other things, which uh, you'll hear about soon. But um, that custom creation of your character is you type something into a box. And I don't think I'm giving away secret sauce because anybody who's kind of in this space could figure this out. But you and you can t try it out right now, but you type what you want your character to be like. Uh, this is again pre custom ChatGPT, and then that gets fed to ChatGPT. And ChatGPT has the set of parameters that we've worked with it, where in the background it will refine your prompt to give you an approximation of like a clean character, a clean version of what you asked for. And then you can choose between three different uh, like 3D models. Um, and fast forward something like a month, maybe less, and then. OpenAI is like, hey, custom GPT, 
right? Um, and so it's it's I I love the time there, and obviously I'm very biased, but I think it's it's this mixture of all of these things that are like so in vogue, and the ability to move fast on account of being a startup, and the ability of having a team of people who are so passionate and interested in all of the same things just makes it so that we're all kind of hyping each other up uh, mm. and like running together. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like uh, just knowing, having shared your background, it, I would imagine that a lot of people looking glass don't have that exact story, but maybe stories that are similar. And I think that it's so difficult. It can be, it can feel very difficult right now in an, in a time where it is overwhelming the amount of stuff that's coming out. I mean, you even said it's like a month later, custom GPTs. It's, it's something that, you know, maybe the three of us were all attuned to someone listening to this. If they have a background in, you know, uh, in the creative arts, I think it's, it feels like it's very much the, at the forefront of the conversation. But I think the beauty too, is that it's like, everyone has something to offer. You know, if you're a 3d artist, if you're a marketer, if you're, uh, like if you're a coder, if you're someone who's just like really passionate about experimenting with future technology and finding ways to kind of take these puzzle pieces and make them work together, you know, everyone has something to offer to the conversation. And I think the, my gut reaction when, when it feels like in the last couple of years, when all this stuff started taking off was like, yeah, I mean, especially in a doom, a doomer news cycle, you know, you're thinking like, Oh my gosh, all my skills are getting replaced. And and everything I've spent my whole life learning suddenly is invaluable. But really, it's not that at all. I think it's more so it, thinking about it as like, think about all the freedom that you have now. Think about all, think about much, how, how much faster you can get things done. Um, you know, how many, uh, how many lines you can cross. I didn't know, I'm not the, the strongest coder, but, you know, using AI, sometimes I can put together some pretty complex expressions or drivers that I use in Blender or After Effects. I mean, that's something to be celebrated and, you know, maybe not shied away from. So I think it's awesome that it sounds like that is integral to the culture at Looking Glass. And obviously the tech that you guys are making, I mean, it shows, it shows over and over again with all these different hardware and software uh, developments that you're doing. Yeah, the ethos is very much, you know, tinkers, creators, artists, uh, you know, and for the world. So I, I love that. And obviously the moniker that you'll see uh, everywhere is to the future, because we're just excited about what all these tools. It's not a doom and gloom situation, kind of to your point. It's something where uh, when we see something that is new, for some it might be challenging. And I th I'll speak for myself, but... Uh, I know that there's several team members and, and just that the company as a whole shares this. Um, if there's something new and it's kind of challenging the norm, then it's probably worth exploring and there's probably something to be learned from it. Uh, and that's kind of, that's how I approach these tools. Like as a photographer and filmmaker uh, and as of late as a 3D artist, I'm not um, affronted by text to 3D or text to image. For me, it's like, wow, this is another tool for my arsenal of creativity yeah. because if the goal is self-expression, why wouldn't I want to pick up something that gets me you know, that much closer? I see them all as rough drafts. I actually, the last video on my YouTube channel, which is from a year ago, was uh, using a style GAN to transfer the style of mm. Arcane to uh, to a video. And look at where we are one year later with things like Runway Gen 1 uh, video to video or like Gen 2 text to video, where you can just type something out and then have that happen without having to have all this background knowledge about uh, code and all this stuff. And to your point, like maybe you're not writing a clean code program. And maybe if a programmer were to see what you're writing with ChatGPT, they'd be like, what is going on? But keep in mind, listener, this is the worst it's ever going to get. It's as bad as it's ever going to be because it's just going to keep getting that be that much better. And, and we've seen this cycle. If you've been around, I'll be 30 next year, like, but I've been into this for so damn long. Uh, we've seen the cycle of like, this new thing comes along, people are afraid that it's gonna replace a bunch of stuff. It actually just ends up, yes, it will replace some stuff and people will find other things to do or not, but eventually it makes kind of all that's come about just that much better. And it becomes imbued in this, in this part of it where you don't really think about it anymore. Like I don't think anybody's thinking about, oh God, I'm opening my Google Sheets and I'm so damn angry that it's taking away all these formulas that I have to write. Um, <laughs> like I, definitely not the case for me. You know? Right. Yeah. I want to say too, it's funny, like with this technology, with the looking glass display, like minus just the AI stuff, something I was thinking is it's actually kind of like a new medium, like, right? Like it's something where I could even see myself like I, just this 
been like daydreaming slowly, like uh, just by having this product. But I was even thinking like, oh, you could go to like a jewelry or watch shop, right? Like even if they were on uh display at a booth or something like that and you want to like see a rolex like really close up and in bright amazing detail with like this 3d display like that's something somebody that hasn't been done before that somebody could just say oh i'm gonna go do that go to the shop and like provide them you know charge a thousand to that whatever you want you know it's like a new opportunity that Mm -hmm. just hasn't even been discovered yet like it's it's the device and the technology is just that there's so many more opportunities that just haven't even been traveled down yet. So I don't Absolutely. know, I'm, I, I, to me, like everything with the device has been so eye opening. Right. And like, yeah. and again, when you like bring in AI to it, it's just like makes even more opportunities, which it, it's kind of just, whoo, it, it yeah. gets the I, wheels going on. I love, ideas. I love what you said too, Arturo, about this idea of like, uh, because I think it is just like it's human nature when you're challenged, especially if it's something that is tied to your livelihood mm-hmm. or your sense of you know being or self worth. When those things get challenged, it is I think it's totally natural and normal to to be overwhelmed and mm-hmm. and maybe the gut reaction is not overwhelmingly positive. But it's funny because I think back to this is so so long ago at this point. But my senior quote when I graduated high school, we had to like pick little quotes or whatever. Uh, I was a T.S. Eliot quote. And it was, um, if you aren't in over your head, how will you know how tall you are? And mm. it's harder to do wow. that as you get older, right? Where you spend you spend your life thinking, getting good at something and thinking like, okay, this is the thing I'm good at. And this is what's going to bring me success or whatever that looks like to you. But you're right. The second that you uh, you find yourself in a situation where you feel like, oh, I don't I don't understand this. I'm not comfortable with this. Those are the opportunities, really, that you have to to challenge yourself creatively and find. You know, maybe you find growth. Maybe you don't. Maybe you also just leave it, saying, you know what, I tried it and it wasn't for me, mm-hmm. and that's fine. And you know, that's also a totally valid option mm-hmm. in this kind of ever changing world. But from you know. Michael and I running the meetup and talking to a lot of artists and meeting a lot of people that maybe the gut reaction was not overwhelmingly positive. And now that, you know, the, the news cycle has died down a little bit and people have had time with it. Really, a lot of the people that have engaged with it have found, oh, I'm now making this other cool thing that I was, you know, didn't expect, or it's made my life easier in this way. And like, so I think, yeah, to your point, the worst, you know, the worst approach would be to just without trying it, without looking at it, without exploring it at all, writing it off as like a, you know, overwhelmingly negative thing is it's going to happen whether you're involved with it or not. So you might yeah. as well dip your toes a bit, you know? Yep. I would yeah. rather help shape the technology than be shaped by it. And I think I'm in, mm. in this like beautiful position where with the background that I've given, like I, I'm in a spot where I kind of understand a little bit of every part of the picture. I understand the the way that things are uh, kind of laid out in code and like how something might work or what's possible, what's not possible, what will be possible if we just add this other thing. And then from the creative side, like I have all these endless ideas as we all do, right? And so it's, it's the sort of thing where um, there's that beauty and that challenge and that overwhelm of figuring out how does this fit into my, my artist toolbox? How do I, uh, or into my everyday, like what kind of things can I automate for myself um, that don't uh, necessarily need to have all of this distinct attention or that I can review as an assistant, right? And, and uh, as if it were coming from an assistant and kind of st- start from there. Uh, to free up time for creative pursuits or to free up time for what have you. Um, and, and to that point, like my, um, I'm definitely the type of that will dive maybe a little too deep. So like right now I'm looking into training my own language model just from scratch. What does that look like? Um, because I'd rather if, you know, I understand to some degree how these work. Um, but what does it look like if I train it on my own information? And then will it will I feel more comfortable about the output if it's written in my voice because it's only my my input? And uh, maybe that's something that I will at some point be like, you know what, that's not for me. But I'll gain all this understanding of how all these other tools are working just from doing that little deep dive. And that's kind of the area of uh, that's how I operate. Where I'll just try to put myself in these. I love that's why I love that quote so much and reacted so much to it because it's I love putting myself in. It, I, for me, I know that I am excited and thrilled by something if I'm in that sweet spot of discomfort. Um, mm-hmm. And and I think that's something that like we all share given, you know, it's not easy to make stuff in any 
in 2D or in 3D. It's not easy to animate or be a motion graphics artist. Sure, these tools will make it easier for people to say, hey, look, I made this, uh, even though they don't have the same sort of like hours in, but the hours in and the time spent and the knowledge and the schooling and the learning like will show when, you know, when the dust settles. It's like this is, you know, the difference between something that you get out and, and something that you, um, you know, be, be, between an output and like a project. Um, and then when it's not, the person who put in that time for the project can take that same sort of like ethos and drive and put it towards whatever thing is like most interesting to them or whatever thing uh, is their pivot. And I think that's part of like the beauty of being a creative and of being an artist is just being able to um, play with all these different mediums. Like to Michael's point earlier, it's, I, um, uh, about it, the looking glass and like holograms being a new medium, uh, to give credit where credit is due. I first found out about light fields and like through my own experience, hands on with the red hydrogen phone from like 2018, right? I, yeah. I was working, as I mentioned at Harvard at the time, uh, of the announcement and the, the lectures we shot on red cameras. It's like a six red camera shoot. And so I got an email from red ones like, Hey, uh, just so you know, we're doing this phone. It's going to have this light field display. And I'm like, wait, 3d screen on a phone and I can take video and photo. And there was this whole promise of being able to slap the phone onto the back of a camera and have it drive the brain of the camera. And then later on to be able to shoot with the red cameras in 3d. And that obviously I was extremely excited by that. I was doing a lot of 360 and, and VR content at the time. And so I got one. And immediately fell in love with it. It really changed the way. It was like a new medium for me. It changed the way that I saw photography and film because I literally unlocked a visual third dimension. Like there's something that it just blew my mind because I'm like, I see, I'm seeing stuff with my two eyes that feels so different because I have this depth component to the playback mm -hmm. now. And it really changed photography and film for me. And it kind of renewed, gave me like the second wind for it. And I wanted to find a way to, to share some of the stuff that I was making with other people with my mom and but I wasn't about to buy like a two thousand dollar phone just to ship it to her with some photos and videos <laughs> that I took and so in my digging I found the looking glass portrait and I backed it on Kickstarter and now here we are because wow. there's this like new Love medium that. of of being able to to express the world and the kind of art and the stuff that I want to see in this really uh, emotive and like emotional way that's awesome mm. I love the full circle there from going from the product back to where you started and now to where the product is um, and how your your involvement with the company. Um, and I love that you got to join the company just through kind of like pure excitement for the product. Like that's so awesome. Um, so like just kind of speaking to where, so now you're with the company, everything's been groovy. Uh, I'd love to hear, do you, is there any future goals or developments that you can talk about? Uh, we are working on, uh, depending on the time of release of this podcast, you may or may not have heard <laughs> that there are some very exciting news uh, ahead. So assuming that this is releasing after December 5th uh, or on December 5th, you'll definitely want to be on our website, which is look.glass. Right. Um, but there are, yeah, there's a lot of developments on their way. We're constantly tinkering with stuff. Some of it that doesn't see the light of day and we're a small team. Uh, it's something, you know, less than fewer than 50 people, uh, really? both in Brooklyn wow. and in Hong Kong, uh, moving fast and trying our damnedest not to break things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, in, in terms of, of, of advances that I can speak to a lot of them, uh, weigh on either, Think ways that we can make our technology more accessible for folks, uh, whether that is um, by uh, dimensions or price point and ways that we can uh, integrate some of the cool and exciting tools that we're seeing from either friends or partners or that are openly accessible for folks to use into the stuff that we're doing so that everybody can become a looking glass creator. That's one of the driving forces behind uh, the existing like 2D to 3D conversion, which is now available on blocks. Um, and so that is where kind of the ethos and the, the driving force lies is how do we get, not, how, not only how do we get so many of these displays on desks all over the world so people can have that same like holy crap moment that we love to see so much when we're showing this off to people and which was a large part of the reason why I took the job uh, just to be able to see people's brains blow up in front of me like yours did when you came <laughs> to the office and got to see uh, you know the bigger displays but also uh, make creation and self-expression something that's accessible for folks in, in a way that just 
hasn't been today because the technology wasn't there. So mm. I think those are the, the things that we're excited about and moving toward. That's amazing. Love it. Love it. Um, Wow. I feel like we got a full scope of everything that you've been doing and uh, everything with the company. If somebody were to get a display, this is kind of the last question I have. Mm. Um, what? How would you say, like, what do you think the first things they should do or upload or like experiment with it? Like if you were to give this to your friend and they said, okay, now what do I do with it? Like, what, what should I try first? Um, what, what would you say? I think the lowest barrier to entry would be to try uh, blocks.glass, which is the tool that we've been talking about, which allows you to upload a, any image on your phone and then convert it into a hologram. Um, mm -hmm. That is the lowest barrier of entry for anybody who may not be savvy with 3D tools yet or you're just learning. You can take an image like the one that I showed earlier of the Ninja Turtles, uh, which I created in Midjourney, uh, I believe, or maybe it was Stable Diffusion, and then just convert that into a hologram right away without having to know how to do anything in 3D. And then the second thing, but also first thing, so for 1A and 1B actually, is to jump on the Discord because if you get stuck or you have any questions, um, or you just simply want somebody to talk to about an idea that you have, or you forget anything that we've said here today, uh, I'll mm. be there to answer as well as a bunch of Looking Glass team members and the community of like, I think it's well over like 7,000 people now wow. around wow. the world that have Looking Glasses or are using blocks and are up uploading daily. Uh, so look.glass forward slash community uh, is where you can find our Discord channel um, and our Discord server. And that's where uh, you can get all the help to, or all the answers to the questions that you might have. So that's a must for anybody that uh, gets a looking glass anytime soon. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, all right. Well, Andrew, do you have any other questions? I think we've covered it. Uh, Arturo, if there's anything else you wanted to talk through, obviously uh, the floor is yours. Um, I think we've covered sort of where people who might be getting a new display uh, could find some new info. But um, what about you personally? Is there anywhere uh, people can find some of the work that you're doing or some of the content that you share that you want to uh, shout out? Yeah, this feels like, you know, not to name a podcast in another podcast. I don't know if that's like a faux no, pas, but I feel, like you're, I feel like you're rolling out the uh, the red carpet for me and going, this camera, now this camera and that camera. <laughs> it's all um, you. Feels good. Uh, yeah, you can find my stuff. I would say the, the thing that I am probably most proud of online at the moment is my youtube channel and it's it's a shame and a half uh but also not because i've been quite busy that i haven't been able to upload as much as i would like over the past year but that's where i, I put a lot of effort into the videos that i make uh so you can find that youtube.com forward slash my name which will be somewhere <laughs> arturo j real r e a l um and that's where you'll find uh you know if you're interested in picking up 3d tools or you're interested in keeping up to date with artificial intelligence uh happenings that's where you can find my breakdowns of it and how i fit all of the stuff that we're talking about into my own creative tool set um because i do love to make stuff i love to uh, take new tools and uh, break them, you know, and do, make them do things they're not supposed to do after I figure out how to use them uh, for the things that they are and then sharing that with the world because that's how I like to learn. Um, so that's where that's where I'll point you to because all of the other socials are just kind of this like vortex of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciated Thanks our for conversation. As always, um, thank you so much for, for being so gracious with your time and knowledge with XR Motion. And we are very excited to see what Looking Glass has in store in the future.